Welcome to the start of season two. We've had a busy summer, so let's get you up to date. This is John Anastasiadis, former player, club icon, and B team manager. Make that former B team manager. They got relegated and he's the scapegoat. This is Thomas Scharf, our chief scout and the single biggest influence on our tactical approach. He's been promoted and incumbent director of football Adolfo Aguirre has been kicked to the curb. This is Ivan Savidis, owner, oligarch, bastard. First he sneaks in some new objectives, granted none of them are of high importance, then he lets our training facilities crumble and finally he forces club legend Yorgas Kudas into retirement. This is Unai Emery. As a Villa fan, I love him. As Pauk manager, I despise him. Having broken our hearts in the Conference League semi-finals, Villa couldn't get the job done in the final, losing, perhaps appropriately, on penalties to Marseille. We have risen up the rankings though, and now sit 40th in all of Europe. Fixtures have been released, and we'll open the season with a tough double header against AEK then Olympiakos. Well, actually we'll open the season trying to qualify for the Champions League, but more on that later. First, we need to talk tactics. We have two formations. The roles and individual instructions have been tweaked throughout the season, but these are the main shapes. A 3-4-1-2, cubic zirconia, with the libero stepping up to form a midfield diamond, which was intended to be used against single striker formations. And a 3-3-2-2, Moissanite, with the false nine dropping deep to create the diamond, which was intended to be used against two striker formations. It didn't pan out that way. The 3-4-1-2 was noticeably vulnerable in transition. There were two vulnerabilities, in fact. When we initially lose the ball, one of the covering centre-backs would take responsibility for the opposition striker which would in turn leave their flank completely open. Then, once the libero has reset, there is a handover of marking responsibilities, and as with any handover, that's an opportunity for something to go wrong. And so we actually ended up using the 3-3-2-2 80% of the time. This gave us a solid back three in our rest defence. That's our covering shape whilst in possession, with a ball winner ahead to provide extra cover. We still kept to our principles, attacking mentality, a midfield diamond, and quick interplay, but I want us to be more cavalier. That means some tweaks. Firstly, we'll have the libero coming from one of the outside centre-back positions. We'll still be vulnerable on the flank initially, but we shouldn't have to worry about that later handover. I've also changed the ball-winning midfielder to a support duty. On a defend duty, he's likely to sit a bit too deep in possession, and that will create more of a box than a diamond. I still want him to be the more defensive of the central midfielders, but I want him to push a little higher, and that will create, somewhat lopsidedly, the diamond I'm looking for. Finally, we've switched to wingbacks and loaded them up with individual instructions to try and encourage ball retention. It looks extreme, but remember, these instructions are all relative. They are still wingbacks. They will still try and take on their man, they will still cross, and they'll still hold the width as there's no one in front of them. They just might not do these things all the damn time. We've added a new formation to our jewellery box too. Yttrium Aluminium Garnet. Catchy. The only change here is swapping the deep line forward for a shadow striker, so as to change the movement dynamics up front. Our other formation has also been adjusted to be more appropriate against two striker systems. We've gone for ball playing defenders on the outside and a cover centre-back to act as a sweeper where appropriate. And the same changes to the wing-backs. All formations have a mirror option to give us the flexibility to switch when we need to dress to the right. Who cares about all that though? The off-season is about just one thing. Transfers. In an earlier episode, we earmarked Ivan Nazberg, Magomed Ozdorev and Baba Rahman as likely departures this summer, should we find buyers. Venezia, Dynamo Moscow and Levante were forthcoming, shelling out a combined 6.5 million euros. Wingamp parted with 4.5 million euros to take our fifth choice defensive midfielder Felipe Suarez, and we raised a further million from the sales of twin youngsters Andre Ricardo, Nicolas Quagliata, 
and Vladimir Podonjic. Backup keeper Zivko Zivkovic retired, and the prearranged departures of Tyson, Buena, and Schwab went ahead as expected. Marcos Antonio and Thomas Kajura's loans have ended. There was one more sale to come, and it's a little controversial. Ali Samata scored 20 goals in 49 appearances last season, and was, without doubt, absolutely integral to our success. He's highly influential and happy at the club. He does, however, have only one year remaining on his contract, and I'm not interested in giving a pay rise or increase in playing time. And so, meet Alaves's new two and a half million euro striker. That's 14 players out, 14 million raised. That's a lot of players to replace, so I'll go into a bit more detail on a couple of our new arrivals before revealing our full gamut of signings. Let's head back to the tactics screen and talk about the advanced playmaker. This is Konstantelios' role. If he's not available, then Zivkovic will take over and we'll shuffle our front line. There will also be times we play with two tens, so I need a backup. Someone who can create, score, and is willing to be third choice. I don't ask for much, eh? Someone like Tenerife Loney Robert Lopez, for example. His traits are a bit more trigger-happy than I like, but his attacking contribution was impressive. Sadly, he wants to be a starter. Or maybe a former player like Demetrius Pelkas. Despite registering zero assists, this was a reflection of his teammates finishing, rather than his lack of creativity. His injury history is scary, though. Instead, we've opted for Fivas Bottas. Ooh, fuck is Fivas Bottas. Applying his trade for Hellman Sport in the Easter Divisi, Bottas racked up an impressive 15 goal contributions as an attacking midfielder. Netherlands Second Division is currently sandwiched between the Moldovan Superliga and the Slovenian Perverliga, so there are definitely questions about whether Bottas is good or just playing against bad opposition. Nonetheless, he's willing to be a fringe player, and so we've splashed out 850,000 euros to bring him home to Greece. Another tricky position to fill is the right centre-back spot. I am looking for a player who is, first and foremost, a competent defender, who can play as a libero when needed. Truce de Kong is not an option with his lack of technical ability, and will be shifted into the central spot in our new system. Whilst Liargas should be capable, but he was signed to be a backup at best. Enter Renato Tapia, my favourite odd-toed ungulate. A ball-winning midfielder who played exclusively at DM for Celta Vigo last season. He is comfortable playing at the base of midfield when in possession, and has the physicality and defensive ability to play as a defender. Signed on a free transfer, his arrival is not just about his on-field contribution. One of my aims this summer is to increase the stature of the club by signing high-profile players. Renato Tapia is a player in his prime, who has been a regular starter for a mid-table La Liga club for the last four years, and to me at least, that represents something of a coup for the Greek Super League. Botos and Tapia will be joined by August Erlingmark, a free transfer from Atromatus agreed in January, who can play as a defensive midfielder or drop into the back line. Satiris Alexandropoulos, a 2 million euro signing from Sporting in Portugal, who was on loan at Olympiacos last season, a ball carrying midfielder with similar performance to Marcos Antonio at a third of the price. Diego Valencia, a striker who spent last season on loan at Atromatus, where he scored 15 goals, enough to make him the fourth joint top scorer alongside our own Kirill Despadov. He arrives for 3.1 million. Jose Luis Palomino, maybe our highest profile signing. Arriving on a free from Atalanta, the 34-year-old centre-back might be in the twilight of his career, but still started 42 games last season. And finally, Marcel Lotka, a loan signing from Borussia Dortmund, who will come in as cover to Dominic Kontarski. He performed well in the dry Bundesliga last season for Dortmund's second team, but I'm not sure how much stock can be put into that. So that's just seven players in, which gives us a 22-man squad with cover in every position. We've got flexibility, with a number of players able to play multiple positions, but I do have some worries if we end up with a significant injury at right-back. 
a broken ankle means we'll be without Loraxis for five months. His replacement will be Byron Castillo, a 25-year-old wingback who spent last season on loan at Club Leon in Mexico and arrives for a club record 5.25 million euros. He appeared in our scouting pool and I'd recently seen a video where he was recommended as a long-term replacement for Jesus Navas at Sevilla. Let's see how this pans out. Enough admin, time to see things in action. We'll skip the friendlies though and get straight into the Champions League, starting with a home qualifier against Legia Warsaw, who played a 4-4-2 and so no libero for us. It was a dismantling. Zivkovic volleys us ahead before Konstantelios puts it on a plate for Despadov. A move we were prized at the start of the second half before Despadov wrapped up his hat trick in the 93rd minute. A dominant 4 0 win. The turn leg should have been a formality, but Mark Wilde's deflected effort gave Legia the lead. Despadov equalised just before half time, with Loratis providing the assist, and we all know what happened next. Diego Valencia came on for his full debut and scored the winner. 6 1 on aggregate. Our reward was a homecoming for Despadov against his former club, Luda Goetz Razgrad. Of course, he was the star, striking first time from Suarez's through ball, then sweeping home Jimis's low cross. I do want to take a little look at some of the analytical data for this game, as this was our first competitive fixture using one of our new libero formations. I'm a big fan of the movement animation for seeing positional relationships. Whilst we can't be certain which team has possession at any given moment, you can get a good idea. Now, in possession, movement is fluid, but what we're looking for, as we can see here, is the general structure. Whilst lopsided, which is to be expected given the tactic, we can see that diamond shape cropping up regularly and the players maintaining good supporting distance. This is good. This is what we want to see. We also want to take a closer look at those moments when we lose possession. Here in the 31st minute, Erling Mark is careless and Jordanov intercepts. He plays it into Moore, where Palomino and Tapia can crash in on him. No danger. Now if we go back, in the old system, Kuliarakis would be dropping central, Palomino splitting out, and Tapia would have to come across to cover. This is the moment of the pass. We can see that Palomino and Tapia are able to see both the ball and more. If we consider the movements in the old system, Kuliarakis would not be able to see both at the same time. So either Tapia covers inside, and the ball out to the flank in space is on, or he doesn't, and more is put through on goal. It's a small detail, but that can be the difference between a shot on goal or easily snuffing out an attack. Anyway, to the second leg. Despadov puts us in control from the penalty spot before Alexandropoulos feeds Botos for our second. Tapia gets a late third, heading home Botos's free kick. 3 0 on the night, 5 0 on aggregate. Just one more round between us and the Champions League proper, which will be against Maccabi Tel Aviv, with the first leg sandwiched between our double header against AEK and Olympiakos. See you then.